The following program is a UNC Charlotte production. Welcome inside UNC Charlotte. First up in this edition, an inside look at Andreas Beckler, the artist. It's a show on exhibit at the Projective Eye Gallery at UNC Charlotte's Center City. Then we'll visit with software and information systems major Jeremy Olson. He's grown his company, Tappity, and recently partnered with Sonico Mobile to create the translation app, Languages. This fall, Niner Nation saw the completion of a project that captured the dreams of many. The 49ers football stadium is complete and is a jewel on the UNC Charlotte campus. We'll talk with UNC Charlotte professor and best-selling author A.J. Hartley to learn more about his recent novel that reimagines that Scottish play. Plus, throughout the program, we'll meet donors to the university and scholarship recipients to hear more about how gifts to UNC Charlotte make a direct impact on student learning. All this and more inside UNC Charlotte. Andreas Beckler is a significant participant in the local and international arts community, not just as a collector, but as an artist himself. Now at the Projective Eye Gallery in UNC Charlotte's Center City, you can see the exhibit Andreas Beckler the Artist, a retrospective of his work concentrating on his motion studies, landscapes, figurine works, and self-portraits. Inside UNC Charlotte was invited to bring our cameras into the artist studios for a preview of the exhibit. We are now at Mountain Island Lake, a place we call it Little Italy Peninsula Art Center, and it's a little grouping of houses. They're all built in the same way, uh, simple structures, and um, each house has four studios for artists to work in. We're now in the, in the showroom that uh, I can look at images that are finished. The ones that are framed are um, those that go to galleries and um, so for example if, if, uh, if you look at that green one with the nails so that's uh, one of the figurines that is here not yet finished not framed but it will go it's close to being finished will be on canvas and then framed. His work is primarily abstract narrative, so it, there's a sense of abstraction, but there's also a narrative and a story being told. He manipulates it after he takes the photographs, um, and that's where a lot of the abstraction comes in. Um, he takes a lot of things in and out of focus and plays with selective focus, um, and that obscures or clarifies certain aspects. Um, so. I would say that he's a very free play artist that does abstract narratives and it's somewhat postmodern, but also very contemporary. I don't, I don't think you can totally categorize what he's doing, which is what I like about it. So all these on that wall, you see there are all these figurines. Um, and then lower standing on the floor is um, the motion picture that will go also to a gallery. I found them uh, full of anecdotes, full of uh, sense of humor. Um, he de he's definitely playing with some kind of elements of uh, paradox built on, on, on scale, built on uh, associations and the context of, uh, of objects or, or the, the, the setting of his photo photographs. So they are, um, there are a certain level of narrative, there are some implied stories and uh, kind of intriguing, uh, intriguing moments which are relating to our everyday life experience. And probably um, I find them very autobiographical, that there are some elements which implies connection to his life experience. Um, so very accessible, but also quite, quite personal, I, w I will say. There are a lot of references to the water and to the sand, to the beach, and, and, and Andreas has been talking about it. And there is there is a lot of humor in them, and I think we can see allusions to, to you know, to the to, to the culture that surrounds us. To the in this area, uh, we see again figurines on the on the wall, uh, straight down. 
the three images, they are not framed yet, but the framed ones uh, will come soon and then they go to Art and Architecture College, also downtown. I'm lucky that um, Andreas's creative free play has transpired into this room and that he welcomes the fact that we have a gallery with two glass walls. And he's, as you can see behind me, he's playing with that. So he's using the natural light and the architectural elements of the room to expand his work um, in a more, more of an installation way, which I think um, glorifies it, really, and our space. So it's a mutually beneficial situation. Yeah, this is an uplifting image for me. It uh, shows a girl that walks into spring and uh, f for, the, for the gallery of the UNC, we, uh, we created um, a special installation on fabric for the, the window that goes to the street where the, where the gallery is. So it will be uh, a collection of, of uh, manipulation of this uh, mother image, what I call it. This is derived uh, from a series of shots with, with the idea of, of this girl in spring. And uh, uh, fr from, from this, we took uh, elements to create these, uh, these curtains for the gallery. Nature is always a big part of his work. That's kind of one of his, it's at the locus of everything he does, I think. And then he manipulates nature and creates these settings and these little narratives. These images here are, are winterscapes uh, from Switzerland. Uh, was a lot of snow and um, I transformed them into, into these uh, stretch landscapes. Andras is extremely humble, extremely private and... Uh, gentle. Very gentle very generous and very selfless. And I, I don't think I met anybody like that in my entire life, actually. He's, he's, a, he's very unique. My, my creative process is not uh, uh, thought out. It is picked up. It's there. And then when I have the, the chance to photograph it, uh, then uh, that the that's, that's first step has been taken then. And then from there it, it goes to the computer and then uh, to one of the medias that I can print it on or, or it will be re-photographed again. Or I take an image that is now a two-dimensional picture, for example, and uh, take it with me and go to the lake and put it in the water and put some sand over it and start all over again. So it's, it's a, uh, very often it's just a wonderful playing with, with what is around me. It's really exciting for the Center City Projective Eye Gallery to have him here mostly because we're kind of uncovering all the art he's been doing in the past 10 years that people haven't seen. And so we've, we're just elated to have all of this artwork shown to a lot of people for the first time. course of about a year or two, uh, the Dean, Mary Lynn Calhoun, and, and I and my wife had several discussions about some particular interest that I had, we had, in education and specifically zeroed in on the fact that uh, perhaps young, a lot of young people might grow up in, uh, in families that did not get a particular orientation to college and how to prepare for college. So this was the conclusion that the middle grade university would, be tar would target eighth graders uh, who would spend some time uh, on the campus uh, with a mentor from the College of Education come three or four times a year. But in the course of that discussion, we said we'd like to be able to say to the participants, if you uh, uh, earn a, a satisfactory high school degree, there will be a scholarship opportunity 
uh, available for you. To take a kid who's in middle school and show him what else is out there in the world and what he could possibly become, that really held like a, a great impact on my life. And then actually receiving the scholarship was like, wow, like I really like did something that someone looked at and someone like deemed me worthy. It really like sustained my college education because without it, without it, I would probably be in debt currently. To me, that's, that's the most valuable aspect of supporting higher education and scholarships is the opportunity to, to, to have the contact uh, with the students and, and sort of follow their progression. Jeremy Olson is a software and information systems major here at UNC Charlotte. In 2011, he won the Apple Design Award for his app, Grades. Since then, he's grown his company, Tappity, and recently partnered with Sonico Mobile to create the translation app, Languages. Languages is a offline translation app. One thing that Sonico, uh, our partner, realized is that um, over half of their 30 million users, over the half of their queries were for single words. And the most requested feature was for to be able to have translation without an internet connection. So you, you have a bookshelf full of your actual translation dictionaries. That gives the impression that they're actually there on the phone. So then when you go into the dictionary, you can actually just swipe through like a regular translation dictionary alphabetically or whatever. And we have a lot of cool ways to just browse through the language that are really fun. With, with a smart index that you can put your finger on the, the side of the screen and it magnifies the letters your, your finger is around so you can easily jump to the letter you want. But then the main thing that people are going to use is search and we, we wanted to make search really smart um, and really fast. Um, so basically uh, you, you can start typing a few letters and it will uh, find words that match those letters but it will also find the translation of that word in the other language and we didn't want people to have to switch modes of thinking. So you can type words in either of the languages that you're working with and it will find uh, the correct translation. We spent hundreds of hours on design for languages. We go through the user's experience and think about uh, what they need and uh, go through their like workflow, things like that, analyzing that. Um, and then coming up with, you know, sketching out the interface, sketching out how screens work together, uh, and then going into Photoshop and you know, making it look pretty and all that kind of thing. Jeremy has given me a bunch of uh, different designs to work on within the app, um, but the key, I, the key and major role I've worked on is the icon. Uh, when people go into the app store, the first thing they see of your app is the icon. So it's crucial that it's very thought out and pretty. I usually start out with sketching in a notebook, and then I go to Jeremy and we talk about what, what should be in there and what the users would get out of it. Jeremy's education at UNC Charlotte has played an important role in his success. He enrolled in the Certificate of Business Entrepreneurship and the Venture Prize Student Incubator programs to help grow Tappity. In addition, the courses in software and information systems have refined his design skills. The Human Computer Interaction course and the Rapid Prototyping course uh, those were a big help to me going uh, on kind of solidifying some of the concepts that I had been learning just through practice. In the introduction to human computer interaction the students alternate between doing individual projects and group projects and it basically covers the whole uh, design cycle of human-centered design so it's about going out and finding a problem and understanding users in that problem domain so it means going out on campus or outside of campus and actually interviewing people and really focusing in on a problem in its context and the, how the people really deal with that and then prototyping solutions figuring out what could be possible solutions and then actually sort of doing a, a minor implementation of those solutions and testing it and the big idea there is how do you actually go out and test this with real users to figure out can they really use this what problems do they encounter and the real big point of this is that the whole cycle is iterative that you keep on doing this over and over again actually I've learned a lot currently from our class she she gives a lot a good amount of work but her principles and her design have really 
help me focus on what I need to and when we're designing apps. And then in the rapid prototyping and interface building class, it's really ac actually about taking that middle chunk of the design cycle and delving deeper into it. So what are the tools that we can use to try out our design ideas, to get them out of our brain and into some form that people can, can work with? So we do everything from designing with Play-Doh to actually design a physical form factor of devices to sketching storyboards that are like comic strips, um, paper prototyping, video prototyping with movies. Uh, and then building things with digital tools. So there's all sorts of digital tools. There's actually an explosion right now, digital tools that allow you to prototype your software ideas. Um, and at the end of the class, they actually do a real implementation in a, a programming language like Java. Dr. Toom is in charge of the entrepreneurship program here at UNC Charlotte. When the program started, uh, I really was excited about that. And so I, I took all the classes from that program and uh, we continue to uh, work together. He's, he's helped a lot in different aspects of, of Tappity, kind of networking, making connections to meet people and hooking me up with people in the press uh, here in Charlotte, um, things like that. So uh, uh, Dr. Toon's been a great help for me and a great resource uh, throughout my years here. Whether it's financial or strategic issues, management issues, team building, product development, project management, all these kinds of things are in our certificate program because we want to build strong entrepreneurs. Smart ones to start, but strong ones who are able to manage their business well. But then the third level is we want them to be able to grow it. Over at VenturePrize, now that's over at the Ben Craig Center currently, they have a student incubator there where student-run businesses can apply they can have access to that incubator. Now you get the rooms for free, you get equipment on occasion, you get mentoring by some of the experts who are there. Also, they can connect you with people that they know. We take them through different mentoring, counseling um, sessions with uh, primarily myself and also Devin Collins and Paul Wettenhall who work with me, um, taking them through different aspects of their companies. Um, helping them learn and grow um, and try to advance um, more so through our, through our mentoring than they would on their own. Um, so that's our primary objective. Uh, we take them through different stages of process uh, depending on what level of stage they are in their growth process. Um, for a company like Tappity, they already were in business, they had customers, they had a little bit of revenue. Um, so we kind of went beyond what we normally start a company with because they already had that good foundation. Um, so we helped him refine his business plan. We've done some self-assessments, um, taking him through a SWOT analysis of his company, um, and now we're getting ready to start his 2013 budget and implementing an accounting system and process. What we really want to support is a company like Jeremy's that is not only has a market in Charlotte, but has a market nationwide and even worldwide. Um, Apple has featured it on their main iTunes page. We also have gotten, we, me and Jeremy designed a, uh, a banner that went across right when you open iTunes App Store. It go, there's a banner that it, that shows in uh, languages, and it has the books we design and stuff like that. But I was thinking that this is all the way across the world. It's not just like you know local thing, a project I do at school or for myself. It's this is all across the world, and got thousands and thousands of people using it. And to see these websites uh, showing our app that we've made and headlines like languages, the best translator money can buy it's just really cool because like that's like something we made just something right here we've made we've been working on it for over a year and finally it's paid off a lot of the press that have talked about it and said that like this is just the the best design translation app there is on the market and uh, it's also the funnest to use My father was always very interested because he had very, he only went through the eighth grade, so he, and he was uh, very interested in other people <laughs> being able to do better than that. And uh, so he, uh, this was one of the things he left in his, this foundation that he started in 1996. Uh, well, it's very rewarding and it's just wonderful to be able to to meet these young people and have a little conversation with them, help some people out who might not be able to uh, obtain that uh, further education.
When I finished my master's, I wasn't sure what, um, I knew I wanted to do a PhD, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to stay here or go somewhere else. And um, obviously, funding's a big part of that. And this gift really made it possible for me to stay here and continue doing work within the Charlotte region that I love. So um, it's great to know that I have that security of that funding um, and I don't have to think about that and I can focus my time on my studies instead and on my, um, my research. And that's, that's the difference it makes and it's, it's a huge difference. I think that graduate research and graduate education are really important in a lot of ways. Um, I know that the type of research I do does have effects on our local economy and the city of Charlotte. And so I think that investing in graduate education is a, a great investment in, in your city or your state. You know, that's just a really good thing to do and it's just a very important thing to do. I started talking to the people here that I know on campus, you know, is this, is this real, is it going to happen? And I had been involved in Robinson Hall, uh, Cato Hall, so I knew the campus and uh, I love sports, so this was kind of like my dream project to, to do a new stadium. It's very, it's very hard to find a school of this size that has, that builds a ground up football stadium. Because most schools this size already have a football team and they, they don't, uh, there's no, they may add on to their stadium, but they don't build a new one. So most schools that are building one are much smaller than, than this university. So to have the opportunity to get to go in and do that, I mean, it's truly once in a lifetime. Yeah, that was interesting because I, it's the first time I've been on the inside of building a facility like this. You know, we opened the facility at Marshall University back in 91, and we just kind of moved in there. We really didn't have anything to do with the process. And this was a lot, you know, this was a lot more fun because they would ask my opinion on things. and. Sometimes they would do them, sometimes they wouldn't, but at least you were involved, so it was kind of fun from, from our end. You know, the, we really were able to uh, blend in the architecture uh, of the field house and uh, with the existing buildings, so, you know, to see that and to see how it fit into the context was, was you know, pretty rewarding. Uh, the, the press box was kind of a, a unique challenge because uh, we kind of call it our Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde building because one half kind of responds to the architecture of the CRI campus and then the other half you know wants to be as open and visible to the playing field so uh, that was a that was a pretty unique challenge you know we haven't done a building like that that's kind of two-sided uh, so so to see that actually come off was, was pretty exciting. Come out of the tunnel there is a capstone over the arch where you come out of the tunnel that has the Niner logo etched into the capstone and I always show that to people and that's one that I think a lot of people will walk right by but, uh, but I just think that's, that's one of the best touches. There's not too many places on campus where they put the logo into something that permanent and, uh, and I love the fact that, it, that it's right there and that every time the players come out that's what they're going to come out under. I was here for the uh, scrimmage a couple weeks ago and that was a, another cool experience to see actual fans in the stadium. I mean you know I was talking to the coach after the scrimmage and he was saying how how loud it was and I think you know because everybody's so close to the stadium it's I think the atmosphere is going to be pretty energizing. That was a big day for all of us not only the players but us as coaches to walk out there and you know kind of get a stand out there and take it all in and I always think back to you know like when we won the ACC championship at Wake Forest and beating Boston College that night and you just understand there's a lot of memories out on football fields that you get a chance to to do things that hadn't been done before and to just kind of stand out there and think about there's going to be a lot of long after I'm gone there's still going to be a lot of people you know having a lot of great memories out on this field and so it's that's fun to think about. It's truly an honor and a privilege to get to do it. Um, our whole team is, is extremely proud of it. I'm particularly proud of being an alumni and, and just getting to be a, be a part of it. Now we take a moment to visit with UNC Charlotte professor and best-selling author A.J. Hartley. We learn more about his recent novel that reimagines that Scottish play. The project originated um, when I met uh, David Hewson, the co-author, at Thriller Fest, which is a big uh, writers' conference for, for thriller writers, obviously. The idea of, of taking Shakespeare's story as a, a story set specifically in medieval Scotland but retelling it as a thriller 
um, and doing all the things that you can do in a novel that you can't do with a stage play. Well, I don't think anybody had done that before. And one of the things that we really wanted to do with the novel was make the battles and things that you hear about in the play, because you don't really see much. You, uh, there's a little at the end, but you don't see a lot of combat. Well, we wanted to really show that. And I have experience, because I write fantasy as well as, as thrillers, writing big battles with swords and horses and all that, all that kind of stuff. Thing. So um, we immediately got excited about the idea. And uh, David had been talking to the head of Audible, who had expressed interest in doing some original audio projects. And when I, I heard that it was going to be Alan Cumming, of course, I was, I was delighted because um, he's, he's just a, a, a terrific talent. I love the idea that, uh, that what, what we have done here is create yet another iteration of the Macbeth story. Um, and so it makes sense to me that, that the book itself has a kind of afterlife which goes beyond the text. The idea of, of breaking it up and, and, and rethinking the script for performance, so sort of turning the play, uh, turning the novel back into a play in a way, but a, a play of a very different kind, so that there's a, an ongoing um, reimagining of the story that we have already reimagined. Thanks once again for joining us. You can see more on the web at inside.uncc.edu. And all of our segments are on YouTube. In the meantime, we look forward to seeing you next time right here inside UNC Charlotte.